Hello, welcome to OEN Engage. Thank you for joining us for today's session, Train the Trainer, Introduction to OER Publishing. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm the Senior Director of Publishing at the Open Education Network. Please feel free to say hello and greet one another in the chat. While I share with you some housekeeping items. So moments before we began this session, uh, we were experimenting with captioning. It is turned on. We noticed we can't see it. And so we're trying to troubleshoot the issue and apologize for the technology trouble. Also on Monday, we kicked off the week with our land acknowledgement and community norms. If you'd like to review them, you can find the links in the chat. Now I'm actually based in California, but I was recently in Minnesota for the Library Publishing Forum. Some of you may also have been there. And for the first time I dined at an indigenous food restaurant in Minneapolis called Awamni. And it was a really tasty and fun experience. It excluded dairy, wheat flour and cane sugar. And I got to try my first spruce tip. So if you would like to share your local land acknowledgement in the chat, please do. You can also visit the Native Land Digital site to learn more about these lands that we inhabit. This session is being recorded. Links will be shared after the event. And if you have any comments or questions during the session, we'll be watching chat, please share them there. And we should have time after Kelly's presentation to chat as well. Finally, if you'd like to join us on social media, we are on LinkedIn and Mastodon, and Jamie is sharing those links in the chat. Now, please join me in welcoming our presenter today. Kelly Smith is the Director of Collections and Discovery and the Faculty Innovator at Eastern Kentucky University Libraries. She is also on the Publishing Advisory Group and the Pub 101 Committee both. So thank you, Kelly, for joining us today and all of your contributions to the OEN. I'll hand it over to you. Hey, thanks, Karen. Um, I just wanna double check that everybody can see my screen right now. Does that look good? Great, okay. So let me get my cursor in the right place um, and welcome. Uh, we're delighted to have you all here today and thank you for the work that each of you in our community are doing to make education more equitable, accessible and affordable through open education, yay. Uh, my name is Kelly Smith. I am, as Karen said, the co-chair of the Open Ed Network Publishing Co-op Advisory Group, and I'm also a member of the Pub 101 Committee. And I've been engaged in open publishing here at EKU um, since 2017, if we're just considering open textbooks. But I've been working um, with theses and dissertations, uh, that type of stuff, since 2010. So um, I'm a little bit of an expert, but not a complete expert, because I don't know if any of us are. Um, so this is kind of a meta presentation. I'm going to walk you through this new OEN publishing slide deck. Um, I'm not going to read the provided scripts that are in the notes of each slide. Um, I'm not going to pretend that you're the audience for the presentation. You're actually being trained to give this presentation. So I'm gonna talk you through the why and how um, the slides are included and how to do these. Um, at the end of the presentation, I think, or maybe now, I can't tell because I can't see the chat, um, a link to the slide deck will be provided um, that you will be able to adapt and use for your local context. Um, so a territory acknowledgement slide is included in the OER publishing slide deck. Um, you can customize this to your local context. Um, I left this for Minnesota just because I didn't have time to add a picture of Kentucky, but I will say that I'm coming to you from Kentucky. Um, indigenous peoples have always lived on the land that is now called Kentucky and continue to live here today. The place we call Kentucky is primarily Shawnee, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Osage land. Uh, in the slideshow, there are three broad topics that are covered. Um, so your audience, as you're giving this presentation, will be teachers and faculty who may want to write an open textbook to support their classes. And so the main topics are what problems are we trying to address, what are open textbooks, and why would I write one? 
This slide basically acknowledges that um, OEN has created this content that you've adapted um, and that OEN is a trusted organization with years of experience in the open education space um, who've been supporting librarians and faculty in their efforts to teach using open educational practices and that they partner with universities and colleges, um, consortia, all, all sorts of organizations that are working in this space. So the vision that underlies the open movement and the open education network is one of equity and accessibility. Um, OEN's vision is to be one of the many players that helps the United Nations achieve one of their universal declarations of human rights that higher education should be equally accessible to all. So this slide segues into the problem that equal access to education is hindered by many barriers, um, the first of which is affordability. Um, this slide uh, shows data for Minnesota, but it can be customized to your local context. The slide deck notes uh, include a link to a spreadsheet that lists this data for each state. Uh, it was compiled by the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association. So this comparison from 2018, 20, sorry, from 1980 to 2022 um, acknowledges the way that more and more of the expenses of education have shifted from public funding from state and federal sources up down to individual students and their families um, absorbing more of those costs. So this slide, which I believe is customized for Minnesota and you can change to your context, um, acknowledges that college is expensive, that al alone makes it less accessible for many, and that it sets up the next slide which takes a deeper dive into how the book and supplies costs um, impact students. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the first thing we wanna mention is the problem that we're trying to address with the solution. And the problem is that textbook costs affect students financially, but they also have a tremendous effect on them academically. So if you think about the um, <clears throat> list of expenses on the previous slide, the tuition, fees, housing, transportation, those are unavoidable costs for students. They can't not do those and come to school. Um, so many of them looking for places to save see the textbook costs as a lower priority, um, perhaps something optional that they can still get through class even if they don't have it. Uh, we know from numerous studies that over half of students don't purchase the required textbook or experience other negative outcomes listed here on this slide. So it's important to show this slide that, to show the impact that textbook costs are having on students. Um, the notes segue into the next slide, um, stating that, that these are the affordability issues, but there are other educational equity issues outside of affordability that affect students' academic performance and classroom experience as related to textbooks. So we want our audience to consider the psychological messages that we send to students in terms of who belongs and who does not belong based on the need to buy a $100 textbook that potentially likely does not reflect faces that look like theirs. Um, so these financial barriers and the inability to see themselves in the curriculum can have a direct impact on students' sense of belonging, particularly those who come from historic, historically marginalized backgrounds. Um, so I'm gonna jump out on the limb here and say there's a citation on this slide that is a good one, um, but I, if I were presenting this to my faculty, I think I would recommend using a different um, study and that's the Amy Nussbaum 2020 study. It also explores the theme of belonging um, in the context of a study that she did where she crowdsourced um, a commonly used open stack psychology text um, to make it more diverse and then <clears throat> analyze the effect that had on the student's sense of belonging. So it wasn't a comparison of four year and two year, like it, it specifically was looking at um, belonging in a specific open textbook. Um, I highly recommend um, 
you look at that, that's Amy Nussbaum 2020. Um, but yes, so there's there's multiple studies that talk about this sense of belonging and how commercial textbooks um, frequently have not taken that into account um, because they're not customized to the local needs. <clears throat> um, and the interesting thing about Nussbaum is she pointed out that open textbooks aren't inherently more diverse, but the fact that they have open licenses provide us with the ability to make them more diverse. Um, and to adapt them to our local context. So this slide um, leads into the what and why of open textbooks and why open licenses allow us to do this. So the next series of slides um, explain the broad concept of open publishing as opposed to traditional publishing and the difference between copyright and creative commons. So I'm actually gonna, I think I'm gonna read through the notes that are actually on the slide deck because it helps uh, illustrate how the way the slide deck is set up walks you right through this, this um, sort of visual model. So here I go, I'm gonna read what's on the slides. The model on the left represents how we assume all publishing happens. A publisher invests, publishing, invests in publishing a textbook. Students buy the books. The publisher makes its money back and they make a profit. The publisher pays royalties to the author, typically a single digit percentage. So the publisher is getting most of the um, uh, proceeds. Um, oh, I was supposed to click each time. See, I didn't do that quite right. So each time I went through a bullet point, I should have clicked on that and it would have brought up a new image. Okay. So in open publishing, the model on the right, a faculty member or members at a college or university publish a textbook. Part of the funding is paying faculty upfront for their efforts. At times, especially early in the open movement, funding came to the institutions from the outside, from foundations, government, and consortia. Increasingly, um, these costs are being um, self-funded by universities. Um, hold on, making sure I'm getting all the different parts of this image. I do have to point out that this part, um, for me has been a little bit confusing of which section of this pops up as I, as I hit next. Um, so bear with me here. Um, okay. So some points to make, um, Note that the publishing process could be, um, sorry, exactly the same in the two models, including peer review, copy editing, et cetera. So it's possible to publish a free textbook while also respecting the effort of the author. This more open model also has the potential of addressing inequities in traditional publishing models whose, story, whose stories are told who gets to tell these stories in which a more diverse audience has the potential to contribute to the content creation process while also enhancing the diversity of the gatekeepers to information. So this, the reason this slide is important is that it addresses the assumption that to get a free textbook, somebody must have had to volunteer to write it or the publishing process must have been worse when in fact that's not the case. Okay. There's one more thing that comes into play with both of these models, and that's copyright. Um, in the model on the left, this model wouldn't work if copyright protections didn't exist. In the model on the right, um, the, book, the book published this way also have copyright. If the intent that the book Sorry, if the intent is that the book could be freely copied and shared, then copyright isn't sufficient. To give instructors and students the intended rights to copy and share, we need the publisher to give the textbook a license that allows the user to do these things. Okay, 
See, I was supposed to click each time and I didn't. So if you give this presentation, practice more than I have so that you can figure out when to click next and when to talk. Um, okay, so here we have um, copyright law. So copyright law is extremely important, but it wasn't intended to help people who want to share and have their work adapted. So it isn't sufficient in this case. We need the Creative Commons. Um, and so you can tell it's a Creative Commons work with that little CC symbol. CC is a nonprofit that created licenses to help people who want to share copyrightable intellectual property. So there is copyright, but you're giving more permission to do things with that thing that you have copyrighted. When you see the symbol on a work, it means the creator of the work intends the work to be freely used, shared, and going back to the publishing model, the last thing this model needs is a CC license. Ah, uh, there we go. Little CC shows up on the book when you click. Okay. Um, on this slide, basically, you can explain the different four licenses of Creative Commons: um, CC BY, non-commercial, share alike, and no derivative, and how those components work together. Um, to come up with the different types of licenses, which are shown on the next slide. So the, the uh, components listed on this slide work together to create the different licenses. So depending on which component you're applying, um, it's going to show up in different ways. And then um, in the slide deck, it's got links to Creative Commons that you can share with your audience. Um, to learn more about this. Okay. <clears throat> Creative Commons grants the ability to update content, customize content, and improve content. So the CC licensing gives you permission to copy, share, edit, mix, keep, or use. And this is how textbooks and open practices address some of the issues we talked about earlier in terms of affordability and culturally inclusive curriculum, because we can adapt those sources to our local context. It's kind of the key and what makes um, OER so powerful. And it gets us closer to achieving equitable learning outcomes. Okay. So the next series of slides address the why. Um, why would I want to write an open textbook? It's a lot of work and the commercial publishers provide all this value added content for me. That's the question I get all the time. So um, if you know anything about diffusion of information of innovation theory, you know that in order for someone to adopt a new way of doing things, they need the change to have some benefit to them. Um, so the rewards that are listed here on this slide are benefits for students, but also benefits for the faculty member. And then the slides after this elaborate on each of these points. So the rewards are um, the book is customized for your course. Your students have access day one and they get to keep it forever. They don't lose access at the end of the semester. Um, the students appreciate you. They appreciate that they don't have to buy a book and your book can make an impact in the field. So it's Again, your course, your book, um, you can create a customized book, everything that's on this slide, um, you, can, you can go through each of these points. Designing the content around your learning objectives, you don't have to accept the learning objectives uh, that are created by a publisher to apply to a broad range of people. It can be specifically for your class, you can focus on what matters most to you. And you can even have your book align with your syllabus if you want week one to be the same as chapter one. Um, easily update out of date content. I have to be honest. So at my institution, um, we've we've ad adopted uh, equitable access. So basically students get all their books um, for, it's for free to them because the university is using um, operating budget to pay for the books. So there's not as much of an incentive for faculty members to write their own open textbooks or to even to adopt them for that matter. But there are still faculty that are doing it. And the reason a lot of them tell me is that they had written published, they'd written textbooks with traditional publishers 
and they got frustrated that they couldn't update them quickly enough. Our um, first year writing course right now, they're, 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 they're starting to launch an effort to do an OER because the updates are so um, needed so frequently. So um, that is really a good selling point for authoring your own is that you can, if you need to make changes from semester to semester, year to year, you can. Um, and then of course you can have local examples. And so our first year course obviously is very customized to EKU. It's specific to my institution. It's the perfect um, candidate for an OER. Um, and then what can students do with the book? They can access it, as it said in the first slide, before the first day of class, keep it forever. Um, you can look at the book without needing an access code that will disappear uh, and you don't have to pay for the book. Um, students are definitely appreciative of OER. Um, every, <clears throat> I have tons and tons of examples of faculty who have taught with OER um, and feedback that they've gotten from students about, um, I mean, I have, I have quotes, I have like a quote repository. And one of them is, it must have taken you so long to gather all these resources. Thank you so much. This is really helpful. So that the students actually see the work that was put into it. Um, so that that's interesting to me. Um, yeah, and you, so you're showing that you're prioritizing their learning um, and they feel welcome and seen. And so it builds rapport with your students. Um, the next several slides have um, <clears throat> data and research evidence um, for, for how this benefits students. And so the notes for this slide provide a citation and an extended analysis of Carrie Cutler's 2018 study. It included a control group of students who also rated traditional textbooks, which makes it different from a lot of the research that has been done of just um, doing perceptions of OER. So um, in the original slide deck, you'll see if you look at this, this slide was actually placed um, in, in a different section, um, but I think it belongs here to when you're talking about students being appreciative of the work. Um, they appreciate it and they're using it more. So I went ahead and moved it. This is an example of how you can adapt the slide deck to your needs and where it makes sense for you. You don't take, have to take it exactly as it is. Um, this is another, another um, aspect of the Cutler study from 2018. Um, so students using open textbooks perceived a greater degree of overlap between the ancillary material um, and their textbook than they did with traditional textbooks. And this slide is another article, um, Clinton and Kahn 2019, um, that the withdrawal rate for post-secondary courses with open textbooks was lower than for commercial texts. And that has been, um, that has been seen in a number of other studies as well. Oh, I should also mention that I'm working on a doctoral degree right now, and this is my topic, and I've been working on my literature review all summer, so <laughs> I'm pretty familiar with a lot of this. Um, it's great research. Okay. <clears throat> so a fourth aspect of writing your own textbook um, is basically um, your place in your field, right? So it's kind of a service aspect of how are you contributing to your field? Um, and so uh, you can do a lot of marketing of your book through the um, open repository, such as um, OEN and OER Commons. Um, featuring your book in those repositories gives it greater um, um, impact and visibility. Um, additionally, librarians and instructional designers at other institutions might take your book and cite it and um, like, um, give you props for doing this work. So that's always a good feeling. Um, colleagues around the world may discover your work. You can also connect with future collaborators um, this way and perhaps co-author uh, open textbooks. Um, and the open license mean that your name and attribution will appear in any adaptations that are created. Okay. So faculty authors, um, in this slide are contributing to the practice of their field. And also um, this can be used as a form of um, scholarship of teaching and learning. 
um, for faculty who are applying for promotion and tenure. Um, the other kind of vulnerable thing about publishing open textbooks is the fact that these, um, these sites, there's a lot of open peer review, um, which can be scary, but also very helpful to your work. So um, this is just an example on this slide of a textbook, open textbook, I'm assuming in OER Commons that was reviewed um, by another faculty member. Um, some more data. Um, this slide um, basically illustrates the very influential Colbert, Watson, and Park 2018 study, which found that Pell eligible students experienced a greater positive effect on grades than the population overall, suggesting that OER have the potential to improve educational achievement disparities. Um, very, very helpful study. Definitely check that out and um, and read through that so you're able to maybe answer questions from the faculty about that. <clears throat> okay. So this slide segues back into some more discussion of the theory of belonging um, and how open textbook foster that beyond just the cost savings. Um, so, and I'm just going to read the notes from this slide. Um, these are four ways in which open education can improve student success through the ability to customize the curriculum, through the ability to contextualize the curriculum uh, by making the curriculum more inclusive, and by now acknowledging systemic issues within the curriculum. And then the following slides are going to provide actual examples of how text open textbooks have done each of these things. So um, this is an example of content customization. On the left is an open textbook for a low-level statistics course, very broad. Um, on the right is a derivative that includes content specific to learning statistics with spreadsheets. So this is meeting the specific content goals of a course. Um, contextualization on the left is an open textbook created at Rice University. Um, on the right is a derivative of the textbook. I'm sorry. Um, yes, on the right is a derivative of this textbook. Um, the Canadian edition. So it takes this textbook that's broad and customizes it to the Canadian um, context. Uh, to diversify and ampl amplify voices, um, this book was able to center an indigenous perspective. It's co-authored by an indigenous scholar. And then acknowledging and addressing disparities. This is a biology, uh, biological anthropology open textbook that was created by over 41 authors with a range of specialists with diverse backgrounds, experiences, genders, ethnic ethnicities, and perspectives. Um, so Robin DeRosa sums up the many benefits of open textbooks uh, when she says open textbooks save money, which matters deeply to our students, but they can also create a new relationship between learners and course content. And if teachers choose to acknowledge and enable this, it can have a profound effect on the whole fabric of the course. Um, again, a lot of the things that we were addressed on the previous slides in terms of um, belonging, and customizing things to your local um, context and building relationships with students are really reflected in this quote. So bullet points, what do I need to know about writing an open textbooks? Um, basically, you want to make sure that the faculty don't get scared and feel like they're on their own doing this. It's a really, it's a really big prospect to think about writing not only writing your own book, but publishing it too. So, you know, you don't have to figure it out alone. Um, and don't think, don't worry too much about the tool or platform when you're getting started. Reflect on what you want your students to experience with your book. Um, 
You do, however, need to consider accessibility and inclusivity at the beginning of your project. Um, if you want your students to experience an entire book of images, you got to think about that because that's not necessarily going to be um, super helpful um, with all of your students. Um, an open license, whichever open license you choose, will have implications for you and your work now and in the future. So those are the main points um, that you want faculty to take away in terms of what they really need to know. <clears throat> so this is an example of a faculty member reflecting on choosing an open license um, and how she did that. Um, and she talks about how she was advised um, about using um, what type of licensing. And um, again, with the, with a creative music context, she felt um, that she needed to be a little bit more careful, so she made it non-commercial. Um, so that's just a good example of how you can pick and choose the different components of the license um, to fit what feels right for your field and for your book. Um, and this slide basically goes over um, if you're going to want to include your book in the open textbook library, these are the things that you need to make sure that you, you check these boxes, that all of the content is openly licensed, um, that it's a complete textbook, that it must be in use at multiple higher education institutions, and that it is an original work. Okay. Um, and then you can kind of close with something specifically customizable to what services are available at your institution for your students. So it could be as simple as just consulting with you. Um, if you have a grant program, you can put that. Um, you can list opportunities with OEN. So they could sign up for um, Pub 101 for faculty, which is a training that is being planned for 2025. So that's coming. Um, little preview of that. Um, yeah, if, if you offer other types of support, um, if you offer um, copy editing or maybe project management, maybe you have a graphic designer, any of those types of things that you can list to say, this is you know how we can support you. This is a good uh, place to do that. Okay. And then there's a slide for questions. <laughs> and I am going to put this on here so you can see. I'm assuming somebody put this in the chat. Um, Karen, can I stop sharing and show everybody uh, on the screen and then I can see the chat? Sure. sure. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you, Kelly, for debuting this new resource. So you walk through it in about half an hour. That's probably pretty expedient because you didn't get any questions. I didn't stop for questions and I didn't cover everything that was listed in the notes in each of those slides. So mm -hmm. there's more room for elaboration and discussion. Mm -hmm. Super. In the actual yeah. practice of doing this. In the actual delivery. Mm -hmm. Thank you for making it your own. And I was um, really taken with your familiarity with all of the research and you could speak to which articles might um, really prove your point at different um, times in the presentation. So we have plenty of time for questions here. Um, it could be about these slides. It could be about rolling out a publishing program in general. There are many people in this call who have some experience with that. Just by co coincidence, Cheryl Shook, who authored one of the books that's mentioned in the presentation is in this call. So um, can ask faculty author about her experience. Um, I will pause to see if anyone would like to share something in the chat or unmute. And we're eating through all the chat now. <laughs> yeah, Amanda says she might make the adoption workshop a suggested prerequisite, and then she could skip some of the content that's the same between the two presentations. Yeah, I, I could see how that would be a great choice. And then you can sp spend more time on 
here's what Palni can do for you. Here's what we're looking for in particular projects and, and get more into the specifics of your program. Thanks, Cheryl. In the earlier session, there was a question about working with Scribe. And if I'm not mistaken, Cheryl, you had the experience of working with Scribe on your textbook. Yes, they were lovely. They were very helpful. So I worked with Scribe on the Science of Sleep textbook and just their workflow and the people who worked there, I can't imagine um, doing that book without Scribe. And um, even just working with uh, the, the editor, one of the things that came through was they said, um, our job is to help your voice come through as opposed to, you know, feeling that it was going to be changed after, you know, I had written it. So that process was lovely. I mean, they didn't do a, it wasn't like they did a lot of editing, but just that, you know, their advice and guidance through that. So yeah, I highly recommend Scribe. And then I also, when I led the project that we did at, um, for all of the campuses at University of Hawaii, including the community college campuses, so there were 10 campuses, um, I led a uh, project where we created the anatomy and physiology textbook that we localized and indigenized. And with that, I worked with a company called Book Sprints. And that was also, I, again, I can't imagine doing that project without their uh, facilitation for the Book Sprints. So if anyone ever has questions about doing that kind of work, I can also help with that as well. Super, thank you. I will share a fun fact, and that is that Book Sprints is a close collaborator with the Coco Foundation, which is the creator of Keddy. So we um, are familiar with Book Sprints as well, and it's great you've had that firsthand experience. I'll also mention, to add on to what Cheryl said, um, you can pick and choose the services that you and your author might use with Scribe based on your budget. They will guide you in terms of if you have X amount of dollars, we suggest you spend it on this for this project so that it's not just kind of a blanket approach. There is um, a lot of nuance and customization. Okay, I see um, questions coming in. Cheryl's excited, it's great to hear. Cheryl, thank you. Um, Stephen, how much do you talk about non-textbook OER with potential authors? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Please feel free to unmute. Yeah, are you talking about ancillaries, like working on different types of projects? Yes. So anyone feel free, okay, can't unmute right now, but um, anyone feel free from your personal experience to chime in. But I would say this depends on the program or support that you're in a position to offer that might inform how much you talk about it. Um, there have been different points where at the OEN we've thought, gosh, it would be great in our publishing programs to suggest that open textbook authors, you know, definitely also create ancillaries at the same time. But we thought that was a bit too much of a lift. Um, and so I think people leave it up to their authors or their programs. Melissa? Yeah, um, so we're sort of processing this a bit. In um, Minnesota State, the, the system has um, pilot access to H5P, right? And so different faculty are creating smaller like interactives and things. And what we're trying to figure out is, um, so, and Stephen, if this is off point, let me know. Um, but um, we are both pointing them to existing um, repositories of interactives, but also looking at how can we kind of create our own and make sure that they're aligned or, or at least the metadata makes them searchable um, and functional for other people who might want to use them. So um, and you, you're asking about how do you talk about non-textbook OER with potential authors. One of the things that we're talking about is be sure you have metadata behind it. Be sure you have licensing behind it. Be sure that you troubleshoot for accessibility. So it's a lot of the same conversations that you might have if they're going to build a textbook but it is that bite-sized piece of, um, to me, it's almost like a, a gateway 
uh, to getting them into OER creation because it's a little bit more, well, it's a lot more manageable. So is that kind of where you were wanting this to go, Stephen? Thanks, Melissa. Alexandria asks, a lot of these books have many authors from many different institutions. Do you have any advice for helping faculty with collaborating with others or managing these large collaborations? So um, there is the Rebus community. They um, host a lot of collaborations uh, across institutions. We have also imagined that the textbooks in development feature on the Open Textbook Library might lead to those kind of connections. That's the big picture in terms of specific advice for helping faculty work in those groups. Does anyone have some firsthand experience they'd like to share? I had one, I've had one, a couple of experiences where I was on like a statewide um, open ed week type call. And like a fact, I noticed that a faculty member from one institution in the chat is saying, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, working on a social work book. And if I know there's a faculty member at my institution doing that same thing, I will connect them. So, I mean, that's just a very being in the right place at the right time kind of thing. But um, that is one way to do it. Thanks, Kelly. And what about at EKU? Uh, Michelle's asking uh, about faculty using different types of platforms. So her faculty have used Pressbooks, SoftChalk, PubPub, Google Docs, OpenAuthor. The list could go on. Um, is that common or is it better to try and get everything on the same platform? What are the opinions out there? I can, I'll speak real quick to mine and then certainly other people can speak up. Um, we, we give a choice basically between um, Manifold and Pressbooks. And it kind of depends on the um, pedagogical intent. But so far, most of the faculty have wanted to use Manifold. Um, we did have a faculty member use Google Sites. Um, and we've had some issues with that in terms of accessibility. So in the future, we're going to tell faculty not to do that if they want our support. So <laughs> it's been a learning experience, but um, yeah. And then there's a lot of ones like PubPub and things where they can go out on their own and um, we're not keeping them from doing that, but we don't, I mean, we support the Pressbooks and Manifold um, publishing for our faculty. Can you say more about what that support means? Like what that looks like? Um, we do accessibility checking. We, we check some content and help them with that. Um, we don't have a big budget for like, we have used Scribe once because we had one-time funds, but we don't have a budget for ongoing editorial support. So we, we have been helping a little bit with that because we have been able to um, identify staff resources. So we have like student employees and, and staff who can help with that kind of thing. So um, we're kind of, I think this is the thing with open publishing, um, which um, was alluded to earlier, way earlier in the chat. Maybe this was in the last session about, um, you know, how you feel about open publishing. And one of them is like, I've done it, but I still feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and so I would say that I'm still in that place a little bit because every time we publish a new book, I'm like, oh, gosh, here's a new thing that I didn't figure out before. Um, but. Yeah, so, but we do support the things we support right now are basic copy editing and accessibility. And like the actual like uploading it and things like that. I know at other institutions, especially at SUNY, they have a, a lot of processes and faculty upload their own things. We don't, we don't have any kind of process for that because the, the faculty we've been working with who've been interested don't have the skills to do that mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kelly. Well, it looks like chat has slowed down. I'll pause another moment in case anyone has an additional question or in case I missed something and you'd like to bring my attention to it. I'll also pause to see if anyone wants to unmute. All questions are welcome. 
Amanda. They're um, looking at Amanda's question in the chat mm -hmm. about ideas of where in the presentation we can pause for audience polls. There, there are some suggested locations in the slide deck. Um, I remember at least one about interacting with the attendees. I can't remember which slide though. Amanda, I I get really excited. This is a little bit of a different presentation, but um, I'm happy to share it with you if you're interested. I get excited kind of with the visioning part of a project. So if you are talking to an audience of, of potential faculty authors who may have already self-identified as I've got a project in mind, like really getting them thinking about the project, their audience, what they want to accomplish. Um, I think those are great opportunities to get people to interact or, or work in pairs to kind of start visioning their project. Um, a little bit different than, than what's here, but I'm happy to share that and you can always work it in. And I think that there was the slide about um, contextualizing, contextualizing for your local um, context. I, I think there'd be some interesting audience interaction in that point. Like it could be, it could be like an open, one of those open-ended poll questions where, you know, like for your field, what's an example of something localized that you might want to include that's not in your existing textbook or something that might get them thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beth asks, traditionally published textbooks often have a schedule for new editions, updated versions. I understand an advantage of OER is the ability to update as needed, but who will that fall to? Once an OER textbook is published, do we think it will essentially be up to the faculty using it to keep it updated as they see fit? That's something I wonder might feel daunting to some faculty who choose to adopt an open textbook but are not comfortable with the publishing part. That this is really an open question. So I'll tell you, um, first of all, <laughs> it's a dream setup for our August tea time. Um, and so uh, I'll find the chat so that you can sign up for that. But we're gonna talk about this very topic at tea time. And uh, Stephanie Buck is sharing a draft of a maintenance schedule, although she calls it something different. Um, to sort of explore this question, because you're right. With the open license, it means anybody can change it and maintain it as they see fit. And so really it is kind of an interesting question to explore like, but as the publisher, as the people supporting the development of this work, do we see a responsibility? I could imagine everything from, hey, we made it. Our job is done here. We put an open license on it. It's up to you to, you know what, we've invested a lot, we're going to maintain it for X amount of years and a million scenarios in between. So we'll explore some of those at tea time. And I see that you're getting some response um, in the chat as well. Anne Marie thinks it's not a long-term commitment on part of the author and publishing institution because of that open license. I do feel like that's a positive quality. You're sharing the load, you're sharing the responsibility for this. You don't have to be the one person who's keeping it up. Okay. Anyone else want to say something before I carry on down the chat about that? Space junk. <laughs> okay. Cheryl says, we realized in the train the trainer session yesterday, one danger of using breakout rooms and online trainings is that we lost quite a few people when we started breakouts. Okay, this might be part of another question about interaction. And yes, Jamboard is headed to the Google graveyard. Okay. Um, so much is happening on chat. My human brain is trying to keep up with it. Zoom has a whiteboard that's kind of cool if anybody, I don't know if anybody's played around with that. Amanda has a pr production schedule and versioning deadlines for the author in collaboration with their capacity. Amanda, do you want to say anything about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am responsible for shepherding, choosing and using sources, which is like the 
most popular OER that we have. It has global audience. It's downloaded almost 3 million times. So we have good reason to keep it up to date. And, um, and so what happened is prior to me being here, there was sort of nothing. And when I got here, I was like, well, we need a production schedule if we're going to continue updating this. And so I sat down with the author and we identified um, like big content updates and what those would look like. And uh, I added versioning into the press book, like a versioning page. And now we have um, quarterly meetings where we talk about what's going to be in the next version. And we set some deadlines for how the author will get that work to me in order to put into the book. And then um, also when I'll have that turned around for them to look at before it goes like all the way live and we announce it. And so far that's working out really great. And it gives us a working timeline for where if something does happen, like we're in emergency mode right now, because are we going to have press books is the big question. Um, I was able to say, hey, we're going to put a pause on any choosing and using updates until we have an answer to that question. But here's what you can expect after we have an answer. Um, I think it's been a really great way to set sustainability goals and also boundaries. What a great combination, sustainability and boundaries. Thanks, Amanda. Anyone else have a question, comment, musing? If you missed it, Jamie put the link to August Tea Time in the chat, z.umn.edu slash tea time. So hopefully we can uh, continue these types of conversations in tea time. It's great to hear that this new slide deck looks like it will be a useful resource to many of you, including those of you who have established programs. Any feedback you have is welcome. This is a living resource and there are committees and groups that wanna be sure that it's kept up to date and in shape for what you need to do. Kelly, any closing thoughts on today's presentation? No, other than I definitely struggle with the publishing images. <laughs> well, we understand your struggle. Are... What's that? We understand your struggle. There were notes in the chat about how Google Slides can make animations tricky. It was very confusing. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for walking us through it. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. If you think of anything later and you want to talk more, uh, you are very welcome to post your questions, ideas, and thoughts in the OEN Google group or reach out to one of the OEN team. Again, the session has been recorded. The video slides and transcripts will be shared with you and posted uh, to the community hub. Thanks again for joining us and best wishes for the rest of your day. Thank you.